It's a giant blanket. <laughs> And a welcome to Mando Bug Crafts, episode 85. What's up, everybody? My name is Amanda, but you may know me on the internet as Mando Bug, and this is my channel on YouTube here where I talk about the things that I am making. This week I have knitting and sewing and some fun with polymer clay. So let's start the shot with something I've learned. This week I was preparing to teach a class on how to knit a Christmas stocking, just a basic contrasting heel and toe, traditional looking stocking, and talking to some fellow knitters, I found out there's two different ways to do Judy's Magic Cast On. I didn't know this. I knew that when I did Judy's Magic Cast On, I had to knit the second row through the back loop because it was always twisted. Otherwise, if I just knit it regularly, I would end up with a row of regular knit stitches and a row of twisted knit stitches. And talking to another knitter, they were like, oh no, I don't have to do that. And so we got to, you know, doing some demos of how they cast on, and that's when I found out there's two different ways to do Judy's Magic cast on. So I made a little video um, just kind of demoing the difference. So I'll put that in here. So with the original Judy's Magic cast on, you're putting your bottom needle stitch on like this, and your top needle stitch on like this, kind of coming from around the outside of both needles to cast on. But, start over. To avoid that twisted row, which you can do instead, is cast on the bottom the exact same way, but when you cast on the top, don't come around the outside of the needle, come up in between the needles and go over and casting on like this will make it so you don't have a twisted row or don't have to knit a row through the back loop. So as you can see it's a slight variation on the cast on but it does it does make a difference and so I've been doing the version where you can avoid the twisted stitches and I think it looks really nice. So um, to, for a full tutorial on how to do the Judy's Magic cast on without twisted stitches, um, check out Michelle Hunter's video on it. You can just uh, go to her website or on YouTube. You can search Michelle Hunter Judy's Magic cast on and that's how she does it and that's a great tutorial to check out. So moving on to finished objects, you guys, <laughs> it is done, kind of. Kind of, right? So there is a disclaimer. I haven't woven in all of my ends yet. There are a lot of ends to weave in on this project, and I just, I didn't get them all woven in. I, um, I did steam block it, so it is blocked, but it is not woven in. And it is massive, and warm, and cozy, and it's just, look at it! It's a giant blanket! <laughs> and it's just, merino, alpaca, silk, angora. This is a luxury treat yourself. I treated myself and it's finally done. I'm so happy. And truth be told, I slept in it last night. I, I did. I, uh, I just wrapped up on the couch and was getting sleepy and I just went off to bed still wrapped in my blanket and went to bed and it was amazing. This thing traps your body heat in. It's got to be the alpaca and the angora fiber content that just, it does not let your heat escape. Now, I don't know from personal experience, but I have heard that angora is especially a heat trapper that some people don't like 100% angora yarn because it's too hot. And this, I don't think, has a large angora content percentage content, but it is enough paired with the alpaca to just trap your heat. It is, it's amazing. Now I do, I do wish I knit it at a tighter gauge. I, I do wish that I had done that. It's not bad. I mean, let me see if I can show you up close. It's not bad, but if I, if I pull on it at all, and you know, blankets tend to be a little heavy. This one's not super heavy because it is lighter from the Angora and alpaca. 
but um, I mean there's just so much yarn it does weigh down a little bit and I think it stretches out my stitches um, in a way that I wish it, that it didn't and in a way that would have been avoided had I knit it at a little bit denser of a gauge. Now I'm a pretty loose knitter and um, apparently Katie is a tight knitter so she knit her, her original on US 8. I went down to US 6 and I probably should have gone down to 5. Four, US 4 may have been too tight and hard on my hands but uh, I think it just dropping down one more would have been perfect but I'm still happy overall I'll see if I can insert some photos for you guys um, so you can see the thing in its entirety it's just a gorgeous it's a gorgeous blanket wrap um, you know I've been told that walking around wearing this is quite the statement um, it definitely makes you stand out um, it's beautiful it's warm it's amazing I'm so happy to have it off the needles so this is my big finished object of the week and Operation Whip Down is going great. I have been finishing so many projects these last couple weeks without casting on, well, casting on very little. So uh, definitely casting on way less than I'm finishing, which is not the normal for me. So I'm very, very excited about that. And you know, I'm just gonna leave this on now because why not? <laughs> So I also finished some more clay pieces. So the macarons are all the same and they're very small, so I'm just going to show you my bag of macarons. I finished the pink and raspberry colored ones that I was showing you, and then I also made some dark chocolate pistachio, which is a dark green and a dark brown. And I'm currently working on lavender, which is obviously a lavender color with a light cream filling. Um, but I also made two little charms. Now, Creative Rachie is the YouTube channel I talked about last week, which I'm just still in love with her channel. She is doing a, I think it's 25, 25 days of craft miss, which is very inspiring for me. And hopefully I can um, take the next year to prepare my own type of craft miss. Um, and I just, I'm loving it. I'm loving it. So every day, in the month of December up till Christmas, she's releasing a video that is kind of in the theme of her channel. So it's usually a polymer clay or resin a video, whether it's a challenge or a tutorial or even a tips and tricks. And they've been a lot of fun and I followed some of the tutorials. So you can see from back here, I mean, these are, these are small charms. They're not small enough to be progress keepers. They are pretty dense and kind of heavy and I wouldn't want to hang them on my knitting um, but they're just so cute there's this Christmas stocking that's got a little uh, holly berries on it it's so cute and then the cat the cat was very very hard uh, I did my best and I think overall it turned out pretty well the j there's just kind of the the join around the neck's a little funky and the face is a little funky. These small faces are very hard to do. She doesn't draw or paint her faces on afterwards. She uses little bits of clay to make them and I like that idea. So I'm going to keep practicing and practicing until I get as good as she is. So I've got my two clays. Um, I also made a Christmas tree that she had a tutorial for. She did a timed challenge video that's new, but she linked back to her old tutorial on how to make it, and I followed that, but I haven't baked it yet, so I don't want to hold it, but um, it's super cute, it's super cute. Um, I found, especially because that star on the top is shaped with your fingers, it's not a mold, and at first I was so frustrated because it's so small and then and your hands feel really fat. I was just like, I can't get it, I can't get it, but I just kept molding and shaping and molding and shaping, and eventually it became that star. So I'm learning with clay, uh, sometimes to get the shape that you want, it's just a lot of molding and shaping and molding and shaping and perfecting until you get to the spot that you want. Um, I am still struggling to keep my fingerprints off the clay. I think that has a lot to do with, you know, while you're working with the clay and it's conditioned, it's warm, and it easily takes impressions like your fingerprints. Whereas if I was quicker and I had to maneuver the clay less, I would be less conditioned, less warm, less likely to take my fingerprints. I've also seen in some clay tutorials that people will use these kind of rubber um, gloves over their fingertips that help keep that from happening. Um, I mean, and I'm still, despite my best efforts to keep my 
area that I'm working on clean, I still get a lot of dust, a lot of colors that aren't supposed to be in the areas, and I'm finding that very frustrating to, to keep the colors clean and free of dust and little bits of clay that were left behind that I didn't see. So, but overall I'm still having a lot of fun playing with polymer clay. So then the other finished object that I have is the bassinet. The bassinet is done and I'm going to tell you right now, I don't want to do that anytime soon again. Like, maybe ever again. I mean, I I enjoyed the challenge. I definitely enjoy challenges. I definitely enjoy pushing myself to do something that I've never done before or maybe that um, I am not maybe skilled enough yet to do. And this was it. And when you put yourself in that situation, it's it's frustrating. It's hard. Even though I knew that this was probably beyond my abilities to just wing a completely new lining for this bassinet, I and I would remind myself like, you know, you are you don't really know what you're doing, so it's okay to make mistakes. But it was still it was still frustrating that um to to fail and redo and fail and redo. But I made it through and overall I'd say I would give myself a B plus. <laughs> a B plus on this project. I think it makes a great bassinet, but the reason it's not an A project is because there are a lot of this there was a lot of fudging. There was a and there's some raw seams on the inside of the hood that I'm not super proud about, but I don't think it's too distracting, but it's not something that I would make and then try to sell to somebody or something I would charge somebody to do for them. So uh, I, as, as much as I think the bassinet is really cute and my friend is very happy about it, um, I definitely think I could have done better, but it was a great learning experience and I'm, I'm happy I did it but I don't want to do it again anytime soon. <laughs> so the bassinet is done and I only have two more projects that are, one really has a deadline, the other is ish, deadline-ish, uh, because the baby's coming in January. So she definitely needed a bassinet to sleep in, so the bassinet's ready, but I also agreed to make the diaper bag and I'd like to have that done before she comes. And then a moose onesie, which the moose onesie isn't gonna be in the newborn size, so that one, I have a little bit of stretch. But, you know, once you hit 36 weeks, which I believe that's where she's at, you know, is that right? Maybe she's 34 weeks. I think she's closer to 36. Anyways, it doesn't matter. Uh, once you get close to the end, you know, the baby really could come any day. This is her first child, so I don't think that it's going to come that early, but you never know what could happen. Um, my guess is that it's going to come closer to her due date, so I do have approximately a month to go. For the diaper bag and I think that's reasonable if I keep getting up before the kids and doing some sewing in the morning. So that's all of my finished objects. Moving on to works in progress. Operation Whip Down is still going strong and I pulled out an old blanket. So finish one blanket, work on some more blankets. So I have two blankets that I'm working on and that crochet blanket, the snowflakes one, I just was not feeling it this week. So I pulled out this knitted sampler blanket. This was a mystery knit along in 2014 for a sampler knit blanket where you knit these squares and they each have different stitch patterns. This one was part of the cable section which was at the end um, and it's just a nice fun checkerboard cable pattern and this was actually the last block in the pattern but I'm still I'm doing a rainbow blanket and I'm on blue and I still have purple and this is actually my first blue square so I have five more blue squares and six purple squares and so I'm just gonna go back through the entire sampler pattern and knit the blocks that I really like or I think will go nice next in the blanket so when I pulled this blanket out I had all the squares knit but none of them assembled. So I actually started assembling the squares. And it was seaming and seaming and seaming and se seaming for days. Um, but I'm very happy. I'm very happy that I've got a good start. So this is a good arms width, arms width blanket and it's gonna be a perfect square. So it's gonna be a good throw sized blanket. This was actually supposed to be my son's blanket. So I started knitting this I think about the time I found out I was pregnant with my son and my son will be turning two in January. <laughs> so um, yeah this was supposed to be for him but 
Or was it supposed to be for him? It was supposed to be for my daughter, because I didn't... I had my daughter in 2014. So actually, wow, so yeah, it was supposed to be for my daughter, not for my son. So, you know, I don't have a very good concept of time sometimes. <laughs> so this was, I started this when I was pregnant with Emily, not Jack. And Emily's going to be turning three. So it's old. It's old. Um, but yeah, I seemed red, orange, yellow, green. And I just got to finish knitting the blue and purple squares and seam it all together. Now, the way that I chose to seam these squares, it gives a really nice seamless join like you don't see anything here's what the back side looks like there is just a little blips of color on the seam because of the seaming method I chose but there's no puckering right sometimes when you seam squares father, father, fabric will gather to one side or the other and that does not happen with the seaming technique uh, but you you do your wrong side does have a little bit of a you can see the seam, but the front remains seamless. So I just kind of started doing it because I've experienced hand sewing. And as I started seaming it, I didn't want to do the woven stitch that was used in the pattern because I didn't want to bulk up the seams. I just kind of started weaving back and forth, almost like a mattress stitch, but mattr mattress stitches will gather fabric on the wrong side and I didn't want that to happen. So it's like a modified mattress stitch. I thought that I may have <laughs> created something that had never been done before unintentionally um, but of course as I said out to the internet it has been done I don't think that it has a name but the blog that I found it on was called like invisible seam so I'll link to that in the description box below and you can check that out if you're interested but of course I shot a little video and put it up on Instagram too uh, just kind of demoing exactly what I was doing and I'm very happy with the seam that I chose to do on this blanket so that is what I've been working on f as far as a whip goes but I've been finishing a lot of objects right so I use that to justify a new cast on I haven't been really casting on much lately and now that I just have three big shawls and two big blankets as projects and I don't have anything simple I decided to cast on a pair of socks. Now, these are going to be Christmas socks, but they're not the candy cane skew socks that I was talking about last week. I do I do still really want those, but I picked up this yarn. Um, this is Zitron Trekking XXL, and I have it split because I do my socks two at a time. It is, I think, colorway 667. <coughs> Excuse me. And it looks really gory in the cake, right? It's red, or yeah, it's got flecks of red, mostly white, and shades of gray. And so it looks really gory, but I saw a picture of it knit up on the color card, and it kind of looks festive to me. So I thought these would be great Christmas socks, uh, gory Christmas socks, if that's probably what I'll call them. But I'm just doing a vanilla sock, I just have the toes. I didn't get very far. I cast on and I did get through the toe increases to where I think I'm going to stop. So I have been wearing a lot of my hand knit socks lately and I found that there are two or three pairs that I don't wear because they're too big. Not too big in foot length but too big in circumference. And so that really got me thinking when I cast these socks on how many stitches should I knit? And really that comes down to your gauge, right? So I got pretty far up in the toe and I just measured an inch, which is not a proper gauge swatch. It's not the most accurate, but it's something. So within an inch, I was getting exactly eight stitches to the inch, which is a good gauge for socks. I have an eight inch foot circumference. So that puts me in a 64 stitch, 64 stitch sock, which is an average sock. So on US size zeros, I'm getting the proper gauge for a 64 stitch sock for my size foot. But I'm still concerned uh, that they're gonna maybe block and get bigger. Because, you know, I'm pretty sure, I don't, I lost the ball band already, but I'm pretty sure these are super wash. I mean, they're for, they're a sock yarn and most sock yarns are super wash and nylon blends. So, Superwash has a tendency to grow. And so what I've decided to do is I've decided to do a 60 stitch sock in set instead. 
Wow, I can't talk. <laughs> Let me have some tea and see if that helps. <laughs> I'm drinking a vanilla chai tea this morning because it's past coffee time and I'm out of kombucha. I'm out. So I had two brews going, but because Josh was drinking one every day, but then he stopped. And then we had so much kombucha that I decided to just brew one at a time and switch back and forth between the two. But now he started drinking them again every day and so we're out. I'm probably going to start up the second brew again. But for now, a nice vanilla chai will do the trick. So, that does feel better. <laughs> uh, socks. Cast it, doing a 60 stitch sock is going to give me a half inch negative ease, which will give me room in case this blocks and grows, it will still fit perfectly. And if it doesn't grow when I block it, then it's going to be a little tighter and snugger, but I don't think a half inch negative ease is going to be um, too small that it bothers me. So it's kind of an experiment. I have learned that I really want to make better notes about how I make my socks in my Ravelry notebook. That way when I go back, when I do start wearing the socks and find that this this pair fits me the best, um, I know what I did and what exactly my gauge was. Because not all fingering weight yarns are made the same. They're just not. Some are really light, some are really heavy, and if you just always do 64 stitch sock on US zeros, they're not all going to end up the same size. So, um, yeah, that's my little rant about these socks. I'm going to try 60 stitch and see see how it goes. And this is just going to be my travel knitting, my VKN knitting, my evening knitting because the lights are off and I don't have to be, I can't see what I'm working on. Most of the other projects I'm knitting are patterned or complex and I can't knit them in the dark. So that's how I justified this. Do you like how I justified it? <laughs> oh, and this bag right here I got from Banna and Bean. It's my jack bag and I love it because it's still in season because the Nightmare Before Christmas has Christmas in it. Still in season. Um, oh, and then there's only one other thing that I'm working on and I mean I put it in works in progress. I don't, I didn't really know where to put it, <laughs> but I made this piece of felt. So I tried my hand at art felt. I got a art felt pillow kit where I have it here or it fell. Uh, right here. So I got this art felt pillow kit, but I didn't want to make a pillow, I just wanted to make a piece of felt that I could use for, I don't know, sewing something, embroidering it, creating it, and like treating it like a piece of fabric. So, um, but I bought this kit because it had everything you need except for the tacking board, which I got separately, but it came with two felting needles, all of the roving and the yarn that you can design with. I decided not to do a design with the yarn, I just played with the roving. So if you don't know anything about art felt, there is a piece of paper that I know is primarily like cornstarch and other things. And you draft out pieces of roving and you f just kind of felt it into the paper to kind of just tack it in place. You don't actually have to felt it because you're not you're gonna use water and agitation to felt it later you just want to tack it into place where you want it and so you draft out your colors and you lay them in the design that you want and then you end up submerging this and getting it wet wrapping it up in plastic so that it doesn't touch itself and felt onto itself um, and you end up putting a towel in the middle as you roll it and then you put it in a pair of like pantyhose and throw it in your dryer and that's what felt it. It's wet, it's getting agitated in your dryer and you felt it from roving into this nice piece of felt and it's, I'm really pulling, it is sturdy. Um, you lay the fibers down in a way that it's not just all the same direction, right? You have to cross hatch, you have to go horizontally, vertically, you can even start to go diagonally if you want, and then you can do your pretty pattern on top once you have your nice foundation down. You can see my foundation was all brown. Um, and you can see some white spots poking through, and that's not because I had holes, that's because um, with the art felt, with the, the felting needle, it will push, sometimes push the fibers all the way through the back. Um, at least that's what I think. Maybe there were holes, but I'm pretty sure there weren't because I put a lot of brown down. Um, 
So this pattern wasn't exactly what I was going for, but it is fun. I have no idea what I'm going to do with this piece of felt, but it was a lot of fun to create. I'm really excited to get some more colorful felting wool and see what kind of patterns I can come up with. I think this is a great if you wanted a 100% wool felt piece, this is a great way to start with a background and then go in and hand needle felt a picture or landscape or details on top. And then because it is um, wool, you can even go in and embroider and add embellishments. And I just think there's a lot of room for creativity with this. So I'm glad that I started playing with it and I'm interested to see the kinds of things I can make with this. So my first art felt square. Oh, and just to give you an idea, um, obviously when you felt things they shrink. So this was probably about this wide when I was working with it. So in order to get a piece this size, you, you're you working with a big piece of fabric, which can be difficult when it comes to maneuvering it and f actually felting it. You need a really wide piece of pantyhose to fit it in. I think, um, I'm going to try to be more conscious about the size of piece that I'm working with, but this was a lot of fun. So, oh, and that paper I told you guys about, it dissolves in boiling water. So the paper was on the back, but I just dipped the whole thing in boiling water after I was done and the paper dissolved. And you don't have to dissolve the paper, but I did because I didn't want to see it. But yeah, it's, art felt's really cool. It's really fun. I think you guys should um, check it out. So what else? That's all of my crafting content this week, you guys. So that takes me to Let's Chat. So if you're not interested in the more personal side of my videos, I will see you guys ne next week. <laughs> Otherwise, um, well, I guess this is kind of crafty related, uh, but I don't have... It's hard to show, so I'm not going to try to bring it in here. But um, I went over to Lori's house and we made swags which was we just took the extra trimmings off her tree and kind of bundled them up with wire and just decorated them. Hers is hanging on her front door and looks so, so beautiful. Mine uh, is hanging on the side of my house because I already have a wreath that I made years ago that I hang on the door. So we had a lot of fun doing that, and that was the same night that we went to paint night. Now, I think I told you guys that I won a free seat in um, a, paint, a local paint night place called Pino's Palette. So they do a giveaway every Monday, and the very first week I entered, I won. And so we went and I cashed that seat in last Saturday. Yeah, last Saturday. And it was for this beautiful winter painting. I'm going to see if I can show you guys. Uh, yep. So this beautiful winter painting. Now, the original did not have this little orange lump here. This was my semi-failed attempt to put a pumpkin on the fence. I have a pumpkin-themed kitchen, and I wanted to be able to swap out my paintings seasonally. And so I thought, well, instead of a red cardinal, which is what the original painting was, I will put a pumpkin on the fence and kind of drizzle some snow on it. But I didn't have a reference photo, and I don't really know what I'm doing. So I painted the pumpkin on and tried to drizzle snow on him, but he really just looks like I tried to white him out on top. So it's not the best, but I'm, I'm, I'm happy with it. I'm just not... I think it could be better. That's a problem. I think it could be better, but I don't think it's necessarily bad. But I'm in love with the rest of the scene. I just... I think it's beautiful. We got to do some really fun paint splattering to create the stars in the background because you paint your whole canvas dark blue but then you get to put those splatters on and then you just start painting over the top so then we did the hills and then the white trees and the birch trees and then the front trees in the original she didn't put snow on her front trees but she painted them in a different way and I failed and mine ended up just like green and just too much paint and blocky so I went back in with the white and I was like well this will just make it look like it got snowed on so uh, it was a lot of fun, and I'm really enjoying the paint nights. You know, just have a glass of wine and have fun painting a picture. Um, I just, I'm trying to be conscious not to go to too many because I don't want to have so many paintings that I have nowhere to put them. <laughs> but it was a lot of fun. And then other than that, the only thing I was going to talk about is, you know, it's been really cold lately. You know, it's 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 winter so or at least I think it's winter I still haven't checked it to see if it was but 
uh, we've been making a lot of soups and I wanted to share two soup recipes with you guys that I've made for dinner that I've just absolutely loved. So I am a big Budget Bites lover. I love her recipes. They're so full of flavor and she's very friendly, like conscious, uh, but she's budget con conscious, right? That's why it's called Budget Bites. She breaks down the cost of the meal to the cent. Like she even prices out the cost of spices, which like the cost of a spice per teaspoon is small, but she even, she's that meticulous about it and I love that about her. So I have her her app which is a couple dollars but she also has almost all of her recipes online for free so the two that I made last week were sausage and kale soup which that one I did modify a little bit because you know sometimes you don't have all the ingredients but you have something similar so instead of the chicken broth I used beef broth and instead of kale I used frozen spinach and it was still amazing now I know some of you guys are vegetarian and or vegan and she does have a lot of vegan, vegetarian options, and it's easy to modify a lot of her recipes to meet those accommodations. So you could go with vegetable stock instead of a, a meat broth, and then um, the sausage and kill soup has beans in it so if you didn't put the sausage in for your protein you still got all the beans and you could probably even add lentils to kind of make up for that instead and then the chicken and pumpkin soup was amazing. Now that entire batch of soup only calls for one chicken breast, but I freeze mine in two packs, so I had double the meat in mine. And again, if you're vegetarian or vegan, leave the chicken out is fine because it's packed full of black beans and other in the pumpkin. It's it's a very heavy filling soup. Um, like I said, you don't need to. Put, she doesn't put a lot of meat in her stuff, so it's easy to take that out and instead of the chicken broth, use a vegetable broth. So. Um, yeah, so even if you are vegan or vegetarian, I still recommend you check out her stuff and see if you can tweak it to make it work for you because it is so delicious. Her recipes are the best. So if you have a soup recipe that is your go-to and your favorite, I would love if you would share it with me either in the comments or in the Ravelry group. Um, and not really just with me, but with everybody. So um, that would be awesome because I'm always on the lookout for different kinds of soup recipes that are yummy in my tummy because that's what I want this winter soup in my tummy so that's all I have for you guys this week thank you so much for hanging out with me this past half hour approximately I'm guessing <laughs> until next time guys happy crafting bye